I'll talk to you about one of the areas I'm uh, uh, really interested in that puts a smile on my face when I'm uh, uh, when I'm thinking about it, which is how to how to defeat infections. So uh, I'll start off by um, going over a few learning objectives for tonight. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, some different modes that Staph aureus uses to establish osteomyelitis. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the host immune response and, and about biofilm. So um, one of the things we need to keep in mind, and I think that uh, uh, Neil and Michael both uh, in their way brought this uh, same topic up, is that orthopedics really is uh, in the midst of this crosshairs of health reform and, and is a... Uh, really a government target in so many ways. And uh, osteoarthritis is uh, up at the top. We see fracture of the neck of the femur, uh, complication of device, which is number nine uh, on this list of most expensive conditions. And then of course we have spine surgery and fractures making the list. Methicillin resistant Staph aureus or MRSA is uh, really a probably the most deadly pathogen we deal with routinely. Uh, there's 1.3 million new infections a year and an estimated 200,000 deaths. And really it's made all sorts of uh, covers of magazines. And uh, most recently, of course, we've spent a lot of time talking about COVID, but uh, uh, this is a problem that's not gonna go away very easily. So why is it really incurable when you get these kinds of infections? You know, we've all seen this sort of infection. Uh, you've got, and this is a x-ray of one of our patients in Virginia who comes in with this horrible construct. And uh, we open this up and take a look and all you see is a bunch of dead bone and surclage wires and the thing's just a mess. Uh, and th this is not an old x-ray. This was this was from about two years ago. So this is, uh, this is current uh, sort of thing we're seeing roll in and it's Staph aureus. So the rates of recurrent infection after revision are really high, about 33%. The people who say that you, know, that you can get these down to one or 2%, I, I don't think are dealing with a, a tough revision practice. This is the sort of stuff we see routinely. Uh, maybe 62% of them are cured at one year post-op, and uh, they frequently reactivate even up to years later. And we've all heard of these cases, you know, that had a staph infection as a child, and then we see them as an older adult, and they have a recurrence, and it's penicillin-sensitive staph, so we know it's the old bug. And I'll show you why that is. We, you know, orthopedists have known this for 200 years that it gets in the bone, but uh, I'll show you how it actually does that. So, you know, this is a typical case. You know, this, this is a patient who's got a total hip replacement and it gets infected. And uh, this is a patient who one of my colleagues treated when I was still in Rochester. And a uh, patient ends up with uh, uh, dialysis uh, for a while after too much uh, aminoglycoside causes renal failure and finally ends up with the thing explanted can't walk is miserable, uh, quite expensive case as well. So we, we have to create a model that replicates the human condition uh, in uh, bone. And this is an in vivo model. This is not a Petri dish model. This is in a mouse. So the implant is a little uh, uh, wire there that's about the size of a 29 gauge needle. And it's pushed through the bone of a uh, mouse uh, tibia here and you see how uh, the progression causes a reproducible osteomyelitis and the mouse doesn't get sick or die and I think there's like 8,000 of these we've done in the lab now so it's a very reproducible operation and, and that's a model that we've adopted as uh, uh, studying infection. One of the nice things is you can use a bioluminescent staph. So these staph uh, have the genome uh, modified by putting uh, the lux operon in the genome, which is uh, the thing that makes the tail of a firefly glow. And so as the bacteria multiply, 
there around four days to 11 days as the infection is really starting to get established and the bacteria are in a planktonic growth phase, you can measure the amount of light coming out of the lag with the IVIS dark box. The IVIS machine tells you how much growth there is. And so really what you see there is around 11 days is when these infections are becoming uh, clinically obvious. And, you know, we all know that as uh, surgeons that this is uh, what happens. So uh, where are these bacteria hiding? Well, they really hide in three different areas. They can hide in the soft tissue, biofilm on the implants, necrotic tissue, and then uh, inside the bone cells. So one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, we saw when we did this model that I showed you with the pin through the tibia or what's called staphylococcal abscess communities. Uh, we didn't describe these. These were previously described in the kidney, uh, but we saw that these uh, sacs or staphylococcal uh, abscess communities form in the medullary canal of the bone. And this is what they look like. So you see this uh, eosinophilic rim and you know the bacteria is in the middle and it's surrounded by, uh, by a bunch of macrophages. And so uh, what ends up happening is the staph secretes virulence factors. It kills all your neutrophils. Um, those those uh, secreted virulence factors are called leukocytins. They kill white blood cells. And uh, uh, then it seems to be surrounded by this group of macrophages that can't penetrate it. And of course, uh, you know, this was described long before any of us were alive. Uh, by Sir Benjamin Collins Brody. It's the Brody's abscess, of course. But uh, this is uh, what we saw in the uh, mouse tibia. So the macrophages are excluded from the staphylococcal abscess communities uh, because when, when the staph kills the neutrophils, uh, the DNA of the neutrophil are chopped up by an enzyme called nuclease or nuke and um, uh, adenosine synthase and adenosine is released and uh, it it repels the macrophages from uh, this uh, center of uh, uh, bacteria. So all of you've heard of apoptosis uh, but Probably not too many of you know about netosis, uh, and you know you certainly know about necrosis. Uh, netosis is uh, uh, when a uh, neutrophil spits its DNA out; it commits suicide and spits its DNA out on the bacteria and makes these nets. Uh, and the nets, uh, if you're caught in a net, you want a pair of scissors to escape from the net. The staff uses nuclease. Uh, the nuke uh, protein to escape. That's the scissors that cuts the gnat. And uh, it's one of our defense mechanisms uh, against uh, Staph aureus. And uh, uh, the uh, nuclease allows the staff to escape the gnat and adenosine synthase generates adenosine, which binds to the macrophage and repels it. Uh, so that's that's one of the bacterial defense mechanisms. Uh, the staph uh, abscess communities uh, form in the bone marrow about two weeks after the um, infection is uh, in place. And so just think of this in terms of your own infections. A lot of people say, well, it's an early infection three or four weeks later. You can just wash it out. Don't change the implants. Just think that this is going on inside the bone. And um, I want everyone to understand that this is happening. I, uh, when my lab partner, Eddie Schwartz, showed me this, uh, he said, we just discovered something magnificent. The sacs are in the bone marrow. And I told him, it's a Brody's abscess, stupid. But uh, he, <laughs> uh, so he, this is uh, one of his slides. He, he was very excited about it. And uh, I, I, I keep that in there and so does he. It's kind of a funny moment. Um, so it forms these vicious uh, cycles. The, um, the staph abscess communities uh, will spit off a uh, daughter uh, of the abscess community and it replicates and spreads in the bone marrow. 
and, and it continues spreading and you get this fairly widespread osteomyelitis in the bone marrow. Um, and we, we were able to show again that the light coming off of the tibia really is a marker of planktonic growth of the bacteria. So around 11 days, you see it kind of disappears. It goes in 14 days, 18 days, there's no more light coming out. And that's because the bacteria are forming a biofilm. And so the biofilm forms on not only the implant, that, that needle or a little thin wire we have in the bone, but also on the necrotic tissue. So this should scare all surgeons. And I hope we'll maybe change the way you think about your early infections. So one day, and I'll show a close up of one day just so everyone gets a full view of it. Three days, seven days, 14 days, and 28 days after we establish an infection uh, on a piece of stainless steel in vivo. This is not in a petri dish, this is in a mouse's leg. And we know mice have good immune systems, they have a better immune system than we do. And this is what it looks like with the biofilm. And you notice there at 28 days, you see what looks like a honeycomb or an empty bee's nest. And the first time I saw this, I thought it had to be an artifact. These are electron micrographs. And I, I said, this has to be an artifact. This is not, this isn't real. I don't understand this. And so basically what we did is looked at it as uh, one day onward, all the way out to 64 days. And the bacteria emigrate out of the biofilm and, and then they spread, you know, they spread to other areas. So that's what's happening. And the honeycomb uh, appearance is where the bacteria have left the biofilm. If you look at it at three days, you see all the bacteria nesting there. Uh, you can see some of them at seven days, but 14 and 28 days, they're leaving the biofilm and spreading up and down the implant, up and down the tibia. So that's what's happening here. Uh, that's um, modulated by the accessory gene regulator of staph. So we know which gene allows that to happen. That's the emigration gene. And this is a close up of what your implant looks like at one day. So we've got some red blood cells, some fibrin, some bacteria, got all kinds of stuff on the implant at one day. So the early infection, in fact, isn't so early, seven days later, 14 days later, you have a pretty, pretty established biofilm then. And uh, all of us should recognize that this is the case. So if you're going to leave your implant in and just hose it off, just remember this stuff is still there. It's not going away. And what does it look like in reality? Well, we've all seen something that looks like this. This is a plate of uh, the tibia. You can see the dead bone and it has a dull appearance. It's not really shiny, it's dull. And the dullness is the biofilm all over the implant. It's also all over the bone and all inside the bone. So we've all seen something that looks like this if not something exactly like this. Um, so what's the real reservoir? You know, we can take out the implant. It doesn't seem to go away. Uh, if you look here, I, that's the total hip I showed you previously. On the back side of a total knee, uh, this is the back side of a total knee in the second panel. The black stuff is osmium tetroxide. And if you look at it on the, on the fourth panel, the second one below where the little yellow arrows are, you see the bacteria mixed in with the biofilm. This on the back side of a total knee, not, not the business side. This is the part that touches the bone. And this is why, you know, these debridement operations don't work with staph. It might work with a more indolent bacterium, but it does not work with staph. And then if you look inside the bone, again, there's your staphylococcal abscess communities. Uh, and those uh, persist unless you uh, get in there as a surgeon and remove them. Now, here's something we found that's really cool. And again, this is really scary. So what this represents is cortex of the bone. I've been showing you the medullary canal and those little uh, passages of osteocyte canaliculi. So deep in your memory from residency, uh, you'll remember there's an osteocyte and it has all these little canalicular 
extensions that go around inside the cortical bone. And what we found out quite by accident, but with our funded research, was that the bacteria, these are Staph aureus, can crawl up the osteocyte canaliculus and occupy the osteocyte lacuna. And you see in some of the pictures, particularly the red arrowed ones, um, they're not round. So staff, remember, is a shape of a ball. It's a caucus, and it doesn't have a tail or feet or any way to swim. So how did it force itself into a bacillus shape, a rod shape, and crawl up the inside of an osteocyte canaliculus? The staph aureus is typically 0.5 to 1 micron in diameter, and typically the canalicular system is 0.2 to 0.3. So somehow it's squeezing in there and growing up the canalicular system. The yellow arrow, if you look at it, is a living osteocyte. That's what they're supposed to look like. And here it is right next to an infected one. So this is under the surface of the bone in the cortex. And you can't wash this off with a squirt gun or scrape it off with a Cobb elevator. This is, this is like inside the cortex. And so it's just sitting there waiting for you to drive a drill bit through it or a medullary reamer or a rasp by it to release those bacteria and get them growing again. And this is how the bacteria persist in the bone for 70 years in some cases. So if you look at it closely, here's a close up of what I showed you. You see they're bacillus shaped and no one ever found this before. We found this by accident and of course we've published it. Uh, but, you know, here there are these odd shapes and uh, they manage to go up inside the canaliculus. So, of course, when you find something really unusual, that is uh, your next uh, research grant application. And so we've gotten funded several times with this finding already, and uh, I'll show you what we've learned. So uh, one of the questions we came up with immediately is we've been told by particularly our infectious disease colleagues. My daughter's out in Seattle training now. She's finishing her ID fellowship. So I'm sure she knows more about this than I do. But um, if you take an oral antibiotic or even an IV antibiotic, it doesn't get in the bone. And we're told that the stuff really just doesn't have good penetrance in the bone. So what we did is we infected mice and then we put BRDU labels in their drinking water and let them drink it. And then we uh, looked at the bone seven, seven or 14 days later. I think these are seven day pictures. And we found that the BRDU got incorporated into the DNA of the staff. So the good news is when you put it in the drinking water, it actually does get in the bone, despite what the uh, medicine docs have told us about the, the uh, drugs, they actually do get there. The problem is they don't work. Uh, there's no cellular immunity and these bacteria are basically not dividing hardly at all. They're really almost in a hibernating state, very, very slow cell division. And so uh, the, the antibiotic that you've given by mouth or even IV, even though it gets to the bacteria, it's not killing them because they need to be killed in rapid cell division. So uh, the antibiotic treatments probably also don't achieve really high concentrations in the bone and they form these uh, so-called small colony variants, uh, which are uh, very hard to kill with antibiotics. They have thick cell walls as we should here. These are actual pictures inside of a mouse's bone. So again, relevant model um, and uh, this is uh, non, not previously reported findings. So, okay, that's a mouse. How about a human? Does it happen in a human being? So the answer is yes. This is, you know, you've all seen a gnarly foot like this with diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, we, everyone has taken call has these come in. I think I cut one of these off every time I'm on trauma call. Um, and, you know, you've got a, a toe that comes off. And so the toe can end up in the lab and then we can take a look at the toe. And sure enough, there's the Staph aureus growing up inside the human uh, cortex, and it looks just like the mouse. So yes, it does happen with a human being. It isn't just in the mouse. 
So, uh, you know, this is an interesting finding. You can look at this uh, and see how the osteocyte lacuna is completely occupied by the staff. So they're in there with their biofilm and they're hiding, they're hiding inside the, uh, uh, the osteocyte lacuna. You've all seen uh, osteolysis and in fact, and later osteomyelitis, osteolysis is one of the hallmarks, right? So what happens is that these acidify the inside of the lacuna, they dissolve away some of the mineral, they eat the, uh, the proteins and whatever other nutrients are in the bone and continue to grow slowly. And what you see eventually is the bone gets rarefied or, or gets uh, osteolysis. And then on a plain x-ray, eventually you can identify it as infected. So this is, this is what's actually happening. And Again, this is underneath the surface of the bone. You can't hose it off with the squirt gun or scrape it off with a curette or something. This is, this is buried, and this should scare all of us. So how does it invade into there since it doesn't have a tail or feet, can't swim up there because we know it's too small to swim in? So what happens is this. this the uh, bacteria gets to the mouth of the osteocyte canaliculus which is on the periosteal surface and it sticks. The, the surface of Staph aureus has what's called adhesins or M-scrams. They're adhesins on the cell wall that stick to the bone like glue. And then it asymmetrically divides up the canalicular system, uh, one cell after another. So the daughter cell will go further up and the next daughter cell will go further up. So it uses what's called a haptotaxis and durotaxis to go up the canal. And so we, we made a model that looks like this with a, a microporous silicone sheet in there. And then the um, uh, bacteria can be deposited on one side and nutrients on the other. And it looks like this with the wild type Staph aureus on it. And that's uh, 0.3 microns, about the same size as a canaliculus. And it grows right through to the other side, amazingly. So it grows through the pores right, right on through. And we have pictures of it growing through. It's amazing. And the question is, how does it do that? What, what allows it to do that? And basically what we found is, uh, and here's a picture of that happening. So uh, penicillin binding protein four is the protein that enables it to do what I just showed you. So if you knock that out, the delta penicillin binding protein four in the, in the uh, panel B shows no bacteria go through. Um, but for the wild type ones, they go right through the silicone. So um, basically, uh, uh, this is uh, what we're doing with these. You can look at it. Uh, we've infected the pin with uh, bacteria, dry it, put it in the tibia of the, uh, the mouse. There's the mouse. And then you take a look at it at 14 days and you can quantify what you get here. Um, what we have then is uh, histology. We look at the histology, we see where it's happening because otherwise it's like looking in the United States to find these things. It's a needle in the haystack. So we're, we look with plain histology, we pop that part off the slide and then do transmission electron microscopy uh, of it. And then you get this. So um, the penicillin binding protein, uh, basically if you prevent it from working, you knock it out, it will not grow up inside the bone. Uh, it only grows up when you have uh, that protein present. So you can uh, try and knock it out with uh, vancomycin, doesn't work. Uh, but if you knock out penicillin binding protein four, it's not gonna grow. So looking at it from a three-dimensional standpoint, there's a really cool technology. This is called a, a tomb tome. And basically, as the ultramicrotome sections off uh, little tiny uh, slices of the uh, resin embedded bone, uh, it goes onto a piece of tape. 
and then you can reconstruct it layer by layer by layer um, to make a three-dimensional model. And um, what you get by stacking it up, like you see on the right, is, a, is an idea of how it invades the cortex. And the red, the red is infected and the green is not infected. And here they are next to each other. And it's hard to understand why some of them are not infected and some of them are. That's, that's obviously a question we need to answer is why do some not get infected? But this really is uh, the problem because once the bone's infected like this, we can't clear it out. Uh, just remember your cells, your immune cells, the macrophage and neutrophils are way too big to get up those canaliculi. Um, and although the antibiotics get in there, they're, they're not working on these very slowly dividing uh, culprits. So uh, without cellular immunity, we're not able to get rid of them. And that's why these things persist. And that's why it's such a problem. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up. I know it's late and uh, probably don't want to put everyone to sleep. So a few things to think about when you're doing surgery, take multiple cultures. A lot of these folks have had some uh, empiric antibiotics used uh, for pretreatment. Uh, try to operate on them and do your biopsies with two weeks of uh, holiday from the drug. Uh, I'll put out there that with Staph aureus, you pretty much need to replace the implants. I know with spine surgery or pelvic implants, these are a pain to replace and uh, my partners seem to like to give me the infected pelvic fractures. They want all the nice ones, but they'll, they'll hand over the infected ones. Even the residents don't want to do them. Um, I've done some of them by myself with a nurse. Uh, perform a thorough bony debridement, including the medullary canal. That might mean using the back scratcher and the medullary reamer, a reamer irrigator aspirator, and clean the thing out good. Um, that really, I think, does make a difference. You get rid of some of those sacs. Um, excise all devitalized tissue. Obviously, you don't want to cut out a nerve or, uh, or a blood vessel if, if possible, but take all the rest of the dead tissue out. It's not going to do them any good. And uh, right now, we are working on diagnostics to try to find the persistence of the infection. We have, we have a couple of things in the lab that show promise, and uh, hopefully we'll make it to the clinic in the not too distant future. Uh, so to summarize, uh, the infected osteocyte canalicular network of live bone is really your major reservoir of infection. This is a colorized picture to horrify you. Um, the staph aureus are immune privileged. The cellular immunity can't get in there. They can't, you know, you really can't use your immune system effectively to get rid of this. And that's mediated by the cell wall enzymes, the adhesins, uh, and also the penicillin binding protein number four. Uh, and these surface adhesins and, and penicillin binding protein four will be future targets for us to, to, to get rid of them. Um, so we, we've got a lot of, of cool stuff going on. I, I will tell you that we have done some work with strap Strep will also invade in the osteocyte canalicular network, just not as quickly and not as effectively. But we do have some pictures of it as well, particularly the group G uh, straps. So um, obviously, I didn't do all this work myself. Uh, this is um, this is the whole group of people that I work with. A bunch of them are from my old place in Rochester. Uh, we do uh, a lot of the stuff in Richmond, but uh, we do have uh, colleagues who have contributed. And uh, uh, this um, in the middle down here, this blonde haired lady, she's uh, up here at the top as well. That's Karen Bentley. Those are all her uh, electron micrographs. She's magnificent at doing this. Um, this work's been funded by AO Trauma Clinical Priority Program on Bone Infection. We've been privileged to have uh, nine straight years of uh, program grant funding for that. And the uh, P30 grant and our P50 grant, we have the P50 grant on bone infection from uh, NIAMS, which we've just reapplied for, uh, you know, competitive renewal on. So, um, you know, this is what funded research can do if you really persist on one topic. And, uh, you know, I'm very pleased with what we've discovered. This is 
these are a couple of the good discoveries. We got a couple more that are really uh, impressive discoveries as well that uh, are being published or are published now. So thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you uh, on behalf of all of us and there'll be many views on the recordings also, uh, Dr. Cates, and uh, especially in light of the fact that it's way late for you at night on the East Coast. So uh, I have three questions and then I have one from Dr. Udawada. Uh, that's a great question. I'm gonna go with him first because it's better than my questions. Uh, in the setting of an unstable fusion or fracture and you have an infection, that age-old equation of stability versus uh, inflammation through persistent stability and stability inferred by hardware. Uh, when do you pull the trigger to take the hardware? And if you have identified staff, do you have to take the hardware out earlier? So give us some guidance as to stability, uh, healing, and ongoing infection propagation. Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I think uh, with any type of infection, even soft tissue infections, stability or holding the area still makes a difference. So, uh, you know, if you have a hand infection or a foot infection or any infection, holding it still seems to help. So um, if the implants are unstable, uh, you should remove them and create some sort of stability. That can be with a frame. It can be with a, a nail. Uh, it can be with a plate. Uh, I would try to minimize the amount of implants you put in if possible, but you do want to achieve stability. The antibiotic bone cement probably doesn't help very much. It, it, the uh, effect of it is gone in two or three days. Um, but stability is important and instability helps infections persist. So uh, I, I think stability is an important uh, thing to achieve whatever way you achieve it. Great answer. And uh, that goes back to Dr. Ted Hansen's original old work uh, also in his clinical experience. <clears throat> Uh, my question to you, number one, is if in your mouse model you give those mice IV antibiotic prophylaxis, could you still create that same scary colonization infiltration of the canaliculi? Um, yes, it still will happen. Uh, it, it happens better if you don't do that. Um, the, the way we originally discovered it was with an infected 5-0 nylon suture next to the bone. So there wasn't even an implant in there. We had done like a sham surgery. And uh, again, it was an incidental finding. It was an accident. We uh, just sutured the mouse up. There's a 5-0 nylon stitch that was infected. And right next to that was the original finding when we did the uh, electron microscopy. So we saw it and we're like, again, is this real? And so we did more of them. And the project initially had a different goal, but we made this uh, tremendous finding. It was a little pilot grant. It was like a $15,000 pilot grant. And so we applied for program grant funding based on this. And, uh, uh, you know, the P50, uh, part of the P50 is on this and part of the uh, CPP bone infections on this now. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a cool finding. You cannot sterilize the implants and the bone with antibiotics locally, systemically, and even antibodies against the staph with antibiotics locally and systemically do not sterilize the implants. Great. So then uh, in our field, at least in spine, there's an increased uh, increasing tendency of industry to offer bioactive, hollow, whatever, uh, permeative membrane surfaces, very complex, uh, allegedly nano uh, structured surfaces for uh, biologic ingrowth. Aren't they just a feast uh, all the more for uh, this kind of an infiltrative process? Do we create a bigger problem perhaps in the future? I, I would say, I would say yes. <laughs> I mean, they are, they are uh, amazingly complex, at least what they show you. So, so I'm very worried about this trend of uh, these complex biomimicking uh, surface uh, 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 implant development. My third quick question, and I wanna uh, leave the field for my colleagues. Uh, I know Dr. Brown had a question also. Um, where are we with staph immunizations? I know you had mentioned that a couple of years ago and I kind of lost uh, uh, the thread on that. So is this uh, something that can be uh, maybe dealt with with immunizations beforehand? So great question. We're, we're actually working on that. We've developed a bunch of targets and we've met with Moderna about it. 
Um, we'll see where that goes, but uh, we are uh, we're actively working on that. Uh, we've we we did the old fashioned ones with passive immunizations. Uh, uh, we've tried uh, active immunization. Uh, the passive immunization helps somewhat, but is not curative for implant associated infection. Um, the and again, that's when someone has an established infection. The uh, passive immunization, in other words, the the mouse is sick. We haven't given it to a person, obviously, but mouse is sick. You give them the passive immunity. The immunity it does help, but it's not curative. So you still have to locally treat the infection. Even with local antibiotics, vancomycin, and passive immunity, you still don't get rid of the infection. So um, we've published this. I think there's about four or five papers we've put out uh, in basic science. Obviously, we haven't done it on a, on a human. We've done it on sheep uh, and on uh, mice.